Last week, I uh, started a series on Luke 15, three parables. And we talked about last week the parable of the lost sheep. Today, we're going to talk about recovering the lost coin. And you know, we've heard these stories since we've, most of us, since we were kids. But there's so much, there's so much depth into these parables of what Christ was really trying to get across. So in our study of Luke 15, as we consider the subject of heaven's joy is what we're doing here. When you listen to these parables, it's all about God's joy, which is the joy of recovering the lost. I don't think you and I can understand the joy he has on this side of heaven of recovering the lost. He gave his all, his son, in that that we just remembered. The scripture says when Christians go to heaven, they enter into the joy of their Lord. The joy, God's joy, is what I want us to focus on. And again, as we conclude it next week, looking at the prodigal son. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The Bible says the perf- that the perfection of heaven is And the eternal presence of God provides a joy unspeakable. To us, it's undefinable. A joy unspeakable. And it's full of glory. In Christ, though, think about it today. In Christ, we can experience a measure of that joy here and now, can't we? Think about it. The joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven. I know me real well. Nothing brings me to my knees quicker than realizing God truly has forgiven all my trespasses, all my sins. The joy of knowing that our future in heaven is secure. It's not who you're holding on to this morning if you know Christ is your Savior. It's who's got a hold of you, and he'll never let go. Amen? The joy of anticipating seeing Christ face to face. I can't even imagine. The joy of anticipating reunion with believers who have gone before. So looking forward to seeing my mom again. And others that I love that have already gone to heaven. will be reunited for eternity. And the joy that comes to us when we anticipate that we will live forever in a place where sin does not exist. The old nature is gone. And there will be the joy of complete fulfillment. Amazing, we try to get our fulfillment and stuff here. We have no idea how that fades into nothing compared to the completeness we're going to have in eternity. And that's our blessed hope that we look forward to. That's why God says, don't get so with all this stuff down here, thinking that's going to get you fulfilled and be happy. I've talked to my five kids who are now getting involved in our company. And teaching them the principles that are so important. And I says, it doesn't matter money. It doesn't matter position, success. It means it's meaningless. I do understand Solomon. It's meaningless compared to focusing and running flat out into eternity for Jesus Christ. And when we catch that idea and that understanding, it will change everything that you do with your priorities of time, your talents, and your treasure. But one of the greatest elements of joy in heaven comes from the salvation of sinners, and that is what these parables are all about. They're about God's joy over each sinner that is found. And I want us to, I wish we could catch a greater glimpse of what that joy is for him, but we won't understand it fully till we see him face to face. Hebrews 12.2 says that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus went to the cross and endured its sufferings. This was God's plan to redeem us because he loves you and me. Amen? Now, this has got to get you excited this morning. I need some heartiness here, okay? (laughs) See, the reason that Jesus Christ came into the world and he associated with sinners was for his eternal joy, to redeem the lost. And this is where his problem was in his ministry. The Pharisees and all the spiritual leaders of Israel did not have God's heart. They considered themselves to be self-righteous, self-appointed spiritual leaders of Israel, and it was this prideful attitude that did not care about sinners. 
They considered sinners and tax collectors to be the lowest of the low. So they relentlessly confronted Jesus over his association with sinners, saying, how can you be of God? They didn't understand. They didn't understand. Mark 2, verses 14 to 17 says, As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. And that, does that ever make you stop and wonder how many times? I believe in divine appointments, okay? Christ comes along, dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. they're sitting there going, wah, 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 with their tax stuff. He says, Follow me. And they get up and follow him to all of the fishermen and everyone else. And you know what? God says that to you and me every single day follow me. Do we get up and follow him? Or just a little bit, Lord, I got to do this over here first. Just a thought. Follow me. And Levi got up and followed him. Verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. Can you imagine why they followed him? It just hit me right now. The Pharisees shunned him. You have no part with us. Jesus says, come, follow me. Do you know how many people there are out in our world out there? They don't believe Jesus wants them to follow him. They don't understand that Jesus loves them. You see, it's the same today. It's the same. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, and he really meant the self-righteous, but sinners. You know, Jesus even sought these self-righteous, Israel's of leader, who did not know that they were truly set sinners. They were looking at the external, I do this, 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 and that. I'm okay, I'm in the club. They wouldn't listen. They were self-deceived individuals. That's how far they were from God. They didn't know that the heart of God was to rescue sinners. They thought that to get close to sinners, to pick them up in their hopelessness and bring them into God's own presence was not what God really, really wanted them to do. They looked at us, we just have to be our own selves and put a wall around us so that we're good before God, which we all know they weren't. But I want to stop here a minute. I added this after I'd pretty much finished the sermon. Before we get too hard on these Pharisees, I asked the question to me, what about me? What about us? How often do we seek after and embrace those in our area of influences and at every cost seek to pick them up in the hopelessness, hopelessness of their lives? Are we just busy? How often do I, we, sacrifice our agenda and our time and make it our priority to bring the lost into God's presence? I fear that too often, like the Pharisees, we just look at the do list and do not list and try to do the right things that will keep us right. But that's just part of the story. That's surrender. That's obedience. It's really not truly God's heart. Like the good shepherd that sought the lost sheep until they were found. Will we seek those who are lost until we find them and bring them back rejoicing? You see, in one of the key, the God of the universe took on human flesh. He came into the world with one purpose, and that was to restore us to himself. Redemption is what brings joy to the Lord's heart. Redemption. Last week in Luke 15, we looked at the parable of the lost sheep. And last week, I said, as far as we're concerned, losing only one sheep out of 100 is not so bad. In fact, you could kind of say it's remarkable. Only 1% lost. In any business, that sounds really good. But with God, every sheep counts. Our first lesson of the parable was, with God, nothing is lost. Think about that. With God, there's no exceptions. Nothing 
is lost. And the second point we talked about last week, <clears throat> we said with God, we live in community with each other. See, we're all one big flock of sheep <laughs> following our shepherd. And we discussed how this applies to our church. And I said meeting only for 75 minutes on Sunday isn't enough to live in community with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's never been his plan. Community groups, prayer groups, various ministries together allows us to use our spiritual gifts. And really Ephesians 4.16 paraphrased says something like this. We are to keep growing and building the body up in love as each part does its work. Now, last Thursday night, I'm thankful for various gifts and abilities, okay? There are certain things I couldn't do, and I'm so thankful for those that could, okay? You wouldn't want me to do any electrical in a building, I'll tell you that right now. It's the same spiritually with all of our gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. The way that we communicate with a lost world, the way we serve each other, And especially when a brother or sister in Christ is going through some adversity, maybe they're an MIA missing in action, or dealing with some sin in their life. Like Christ, we're to come to the rescue as the good shepherds. This isn't just for Jesus Christ. This is for each of us, isn't it? The parable of the good shepherd is to be our model. Not just to be content with those who show up on Sunday morning, but to focus on reaching out to those who do not, and maybe those who never have. This is known as the Great Commission. It's nothing new. Last week's point was, God's heart is to be our heart. No one is to be lost. No one. So today we turn again with this said to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we're going to look at three verses, 8, 9, and 10, the parable of the lost coin. So let's read that text first. Jesus says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here, Jesus continues to confront the Pharisees, spiritual leaders. He now tells this second story about this woman who lost one of her ten silver coins. You say, Pastor Doug, I've heard this so many times. Well, I want us to consider, as we look closely at these three verses, what Jesus is doing in these parables that may not be easily seen at first read. Last week, Jesus asked the Pharisees to see themselves as a shepherd. That's really what he was doing. Think about it. Which one of you, he's talking to the Pharisees. All right, this is what the good shepherd does. Which one of you do that? Today, Jesus is asking the same Pharisees to see themselves as this woman seeking after this lost coin. In verse 8, I love how it starts. Remember, and remember back in verse 4, last week he said, What man among you, if he has 100 sheep, and they would have all gone, Ah, uh, not me. <laughs> Au contraire, they knew French. Yeah. To them, shepherds were unclean, they were defiled, they wouldn't go near a shepherd. And yet Jesus says, which one of you would do that? <clears throat> Jesus is really assaulting their foolish pride. In these parables, he makes them act out in their minds as if they're a shepherd, and today as if they're this woman. What one of you? These spiritual leaders of Israel wouldn't be a shepherd, and they certainly wouldn't be a woman. Yet Jesus said to them, what if you were a shepherd or what if you were this woman? What would you do? Would you go and search relentlessly until you found them? So when we look at these verses, it gives us the four actions that we follow God's heart. Lost, sought, found, celebrated. 
That's what we're going to look at. Verse 8, what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, we start with lost. Mankind is lost. Ever since the Garden of Eden. Until they receive by grace Jesus Christ into their life as their personal Savior. They're lost. It <clears throat> doesn't matter how nice they are, how successful they think they are, whatever. They're lost. This woman has lost one of her ten silver coins. These coins would be probably 4.3 grams of silver. The picture here is that for her, it's a large amount of money, of her savings. So you wouldn't say, ah, it doesn't matter. It's just one. This is a poor family. Of course it matters. In verse 8, she goes from lost, though, to sought. She starts seeking. So the search begins. She lights the lamp, takes out her little clay lamp with oil in it, floats a wick in it, lights it, going around every nick, cranny, corner trying to find this lost coin. She gets out her little twig broom and starts sweeping because her hard, dust, dirty floor might have it might be under some dust on the floor. Maybe it's in a crack. Maybe it's under the dirt. Maybe it's in some debris. Where is it? Or maybe it's under something there, a furnishing of some kind. She reaches with her little broom every corner of the house. She moves everything, lifts up anything it might have rolled under. She looks in every crack by her light. Here we get quite a picture, don't we? Of what God wants us to do with a lot, with people who are lost and don't know Christ. It would keep us pretty busy, wouldn't it? But she keeps it up until we come to the third point at the end of verse 8. It's found. The passion. The intensity for her is whatever it takes to get it found. This is the passion, the intensity that God wants in our lives every day for a lost and dying world. And I have to say, he needs to keep hitting me alongside the head to realize that's my number one priority. But verse 9 begins, and when she found it, <laughs> she found it. Imagine her joy. Can you imagine? If you've had the joy of bringing someone to the Lord, and being God is an instrument that God gave you an opportunity to bring someone to the Lord. I tell you, for the next few days, you're walking six inches off the ground, aren't you? There's no greater joy. God, I remember as little kids choosing up for a baseball team. All the kids out there go, and when I was coaching, I said, choose me, choose me, choose me. <laughs> is that our attitude with God for the lost? Choose me, Lord. Let me have that privilege. Let me have that joy of being used to reach someone for eternity. Choose me. Choose me. She found it. It's the same as the shepherd back in verse 4, after he goes and finds that one that's lost, and then he says, until he finds it. Here in verse 8 and 9, until she finds it. And when she has found it, in both of these parables, we see that they seek that which was lost, with one attitude, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Do we get the picture here of what Christ is telling the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel and what he's telling us here at LifePoint Church? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So the coin was lost, then sought, and now found. And finally, it's celebrated. Verse 9, and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin for which I had lost. Let's have a party. By the way, if you look at these, just an interesting note, these friends and neighbors are different than in the verse 6 and 7 that we read last week, where the shepherd calls his friends and neighbors. Here the word for friend is philos, and the word neighbor is gitonos. And both are in the feminine. These words are both in the feminine. She calls her lady friends, which was really typical of that time. She wouldn't have called men. She called all of her lady friends. They were very close in this little village. They all knew each other. 
Everyone, and this is the point I want to get, at this point, everyone's suffering would be everyone's suffering. And everybody's joy would be everybody's joy. Isn't that a great picture of the church? If one person in our church is hurting, we all hurt for them. If one is filled with joy, we rejoice with him, don't we? What a beautiful picture right there of the church. And so she calls her lady friends together and they have this wonderful little party because she has found what she had lost. Isn't it a joy every day? Imagine if someone would get saved every week at Life Point Church. We'd have a celebration every Sunday, wouldn't we, together? That's what God wants. I believe he's preparing us for that as we move into our new ministry center. He did it for one purpose, that we'll have a greater ministry to impact this area for Jesus Christ. What a privilege. Choose me. And the point to the Pharisees is, you do understand what I'm saying, right? I mean, is it perfectly clear? Of course they would buy into the ethical response of the woman. She did exactly what she would have done. It's what I would have done. But let's talk about application here in verse 10. He says, in the same way. Oops. This is where the finger comes out and he starts pointing at the Pharisees and leaders. He says, I tell you. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. See, that was never the heart or the thought of the Pharisees. They weren't looking for repentance. They were looking to make themselves self-righteous. It was internal, never external, to reach to a world. God wanted to use Israel in the worst way to bring people to Jehovah, God. They turned it inward to themselves and put up a wall. I tell you, Pharisees, and he points right at them, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God who over one sinner who repents. Here Jesus is saying, I'm doing this because this is what brings joy to God. Don't tell me I'm not of God. He wants me to speak to the tax collectors and all the sinners. That's what brings joy to my Father in heaven. That's true for each of us. That's what brings joy to our Father in heaven. You see? He gets no joy out of you 99 self-righteous people who are puffing yourselves up. His joy is in the recovery of a repenting sinner. Those you don't associate with. Now, do you get it? He tells them. And when you read the phrase, I want to make this point, when you read the phrase, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, you might want to assume that this is the angels rejoicing. It really doesn't say that. It says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, where God is. In heaven, the joy is coming from God, you see. It's the joy of God that fills heaven. It's the joy of God that surrounds the angels and all of heaven joins in. But the joy comes from the living God. Amen? It means that much to him. You mean that much to him. You sharing his truth and bringing others to him means that much to him. I love the pictures, a few pictures we get of heaven. I like it when he rolls back in Revelation 4 and 5, the curtain, and we get a little glimpse of heaven. I love that area. But in Revelation chapter 4, we get a glimpse of heaven, and it's a big celebration. Let's look at 4. Here we see the throne of God in all of his splendor and glory, surrounded by angels and the 24 elders representing the redeemed. In verse 8 of chapter 4, they're all saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they're all saying, Worthy art thou. Then in verse 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. There's a whole lot of praise going on because God created But when you come into chapter 5, the praise takes a little different turn. The angels around the throne and the redeemed in verse 9 are singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll. They're focused on Jesus Christ. 
You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Do you see that? They're praising God that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And that because of that, we as his emissaries go out and share the truth and draw people into Jesus Christ, into God. And it's his joy. Now they're praising God for the Lamb of Redemption. Verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands upon times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And they're all saying, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Everybody's praising. Everybody's worshiping. There is joy in heaven. But the source of this joy is God. And the angels just echo the joy of God. That's what he wants for us. We are to echo the joy of God daily. Fallen angels fell. They're not redeemed. Holy angels never fell and therefore need no redemption. They have no experience of redemption, but they enter into the joy of God, which they look interestingly, cannot fully understand. But they echo his joy as creator and redeemer and sustainer. But us, the saints, the redeemed, enter into the joy of God as those who have experienced redemption. They and every one of us will enter into God's joy for all eternity. And when we focus on that, it changes what we do day after day after day, doesn't it? We must keep our eyes on the prize. Keep our eyes on eternity. This is just going to pass away. All the things that I love to do, all the fun hobbies, all the fun things is nothing. And it's going to pass away. Are we prepared to enter into the joy of our salvation? Do we care about others that need to understand? They need to care about knowing the joy of their salvation because the only thing that is real is eternity. This is temporal. See, Luke 15 is about lost and found. Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save, and to save the lost. Our Heavenly Father loves the lost. He really does. No matter what they may have done, no matter how often they have failed, God loves every sinner. And there may be people in leadership today in America, you don't think God loves them, but he does. And we are to love them as well. Doesn't mean we like what they do, but we're to love them and pray for them that God will reach their hearts and change them. And he wants, God wants his heart for the lost to be our hearts. Luke 15, 1 and 2, we read that last week. Uh, The Pharisees and the teachers didn't understand this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered under their breath, I'm sure, to each other, but visible enough that Jesus felt it. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. (laughs) But the question I have for us this morning, what does a heart for the lost look like? I believe it begins by answering a question that we all need to answer alone with God. What's most valuable in my life? What's most valuable in your life? What's your value system? Where do you place your greatest value? I can tell you, when I received Christ in 1969, uh, 19 years of age, and over the last 50, 51 years, my value system has changed dramatically. And you know what? Jesus is ultimately wanting your value system to shift to his too. All the grandiose plans I had for me and all the struggles that I had with things that I wanted to accomplish, little by little, God kept just changing, 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 changing. He pursues us every day. He loves us that much. Let him have his way. Let his heart be your heart, is my 
my, my desire for each of us. That we would be willing to leave those that are already in the Christ and safe, the 99, so to speak, and go out and find the lost. You see? You know, as we pursue God, our priorities will begin to line up with His priorities. That's really what it's about. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I'm going to sidestep for a minute. This morning, if you're feeling like something is missing in your life, feels just kind of dry. Feel like you're in some wilderness someplace. Maybe you need to try to join Jesus in looking for the lost sheep. I'll tell you a story about me. I remember a time a few years after I'd been saved, I accepted Christ in my life in 69. In 73, I chose to make him the Lord of my life. This would have been around 77, 78, somewhere in there, I think 78. I uh, moved up to Traverse City from the Mount Pleasant area, and my pastor, Crab, who had been down there, was up here looking at a church, and we had lunch together. And as I was having lunch with him, he was asking me how I'm doing. I says, I says right now, my Christian life feels a little dry. You know what he did? You had to see his eyes. I still see him. He looked into my eyes, and here's what he said, Doug, have you been leading anyone to Jesus Christ lately? Nope. I'd been focused on a new business, a lot of other things that were getting in the way of what God was going to give me joy for. That was 1978. And since that day, I can tell you my focus has been to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. And because of that, as I've grown in that, it has filled my life with joy. And that joy nothing else can offer. Nothing else can compete with it. And you know, when you experience God's joy for the lost, your heart will become passionate about what God's heart is passionate about. Amen? You see, this passion of God's will overcome every obstacle that you want to throw in the way to do it. This passionate heart will overcome all the fears that you have in choosing to obey God in doing it. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And verse 8 says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. A godly heart passionately celebrates the loss being found. Let's go back to Luke 15 as we begin to close. 5 through 7. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, goes home, and then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99, I'll put in a word, self-righteous persons who do not need to repent. Heaven celebrates with even one person comes to Jesus Christ. You see, today and every day, heaven is inviting you and me to celebrate the lost being found, the sick being healed, and the broken being restored. This is the reason God has provided us, I believe, with an expanded ministry center. We've sought as best we could to be faithful with what we've had, and I believe God is saying, I think I can trust you a little. I'm going to give you a greater opportunity. And I'm so excited that we'll make a larger impact in our community for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wants every one of us to experience the joy that comes from partnering with Him and seeing people come to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And God is asking you and me, each of us, the same questions today. What is of greatest value to you? And do your priorities line up with mine, with God's? My point to say as we close, 
A godly heart passionately celebrates the lost being found. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I thank you for your word. It penetrates into our hearts. It challenges us in every way. But Lord, we need to be challenged. We live in a a world that just wants to pull us away, Father, from serving you obediently. Pull us away from having a passion for the lost. And so this morning, Father, we thank you for your word of encouragement. We ask that, Lord, this week, in these weeks coming up, that we will continue to obediently have your heart to seek the lost, that you might be glorified, and that your kingdom might grow. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.